The title of today's message is Vision. Now, vision is a good topic relevant at any age, physical or spiritual. I only had one person in mind when I wrote this message, Elston Page, a man who maintained vision until the very end. So please don't think anything I say is aimed at you. If you feel that way, it's most likely the Holy Spirit. It means you're listening. Interspersed in this message are several short statements I received about vision. They all start with the word vision, and I've numbered them. I might comment on a few, but in general, I'm simply going to pause for a few seconds after each one and give you time to process it yourself. Just a couple seconds. If you have any questions, you can write down the number and ask me about it later. Like, what did you mean by so-and-so, or I didn't, that meant something to me, what was you know, number 22, what, what is, remind me what that was. So let's get started. One, vision makes it possible to see where you are going. Whoop, I did it. Oh, quit. You know what I'm used to is a, a button that has a left and a right, and it's very confusing. Okay, vision makes it possible to avoid pitfalls and hazards. Okay, now we can get to the next. So let's consider one scenario. What if you were to cross over 29th Street out here on foot with its deep drainage ditches, like that, blindfolded. This is what it would look like to you, black. Not too easy, so let me repeat one and two. Vision makes it possible to see where you are going. Vision makes it possible to avoid pitfalls and hazards. So even though uh, we're on, this may be recorded on YouTube, what's on the screens is really what's most important. So if you're not, you, you're welcome to just focus on that, maybe look at me occasionally, but that's where the really key thing is to get that, to get the bullets and stuff that you see. So one last time, but this time, I don't want you to think about your physical eyes. I want it, you to apply it to your whole life. Vision makes it possible to see where you are going. Vision makes it possible to avoid pitfalls and hazards. Three, vision helps you reach your destination efficiently without wasting precious time and energy. Like if it was completely dark in here, and I said, go find the, the, I don't know, go find the highlighter. Could you imagine how long it would take you to go find that if, you, if it was completely dark and you had no flashlight? But if you had vision, then it's real simple. You don't waste a lot of time in life. You can just go and get, accomplish what you need to do. Four, vision gives you a reason to want to get out of bed in the morning. Vision sees how things could be. Vision gives you a sense of direction. Vision helps you know where you fit in the body of Christ. Number eight, vision helps you see that you're part of a much bigger plan. Vision, number nine, vision gives you a raison d'etre, a reason or purpose for someone's existence. Ten, vision inspires you to aim higher without condemning your current state. Let that sink in. Vision can be lifelong or for a season. I used to be heavily in the CB radio and then amateur radio. It started around ninth grade with a little walkie-talkie, talking on Channel 5 to my best friend at the time, Tom Hab, who lived a couple blocks away. Then each of us got a real CB radio, and I talked to and met lots of nice people. Go ahead, Breaker, you got the Corky one. And uh, there's my dog, Corky, right there. Notice the Gilbert Kim Craft box at the bottom right. I'll mention that in a while. But I wanted more, so I bought books and studied electronics and bought a ham radio receiver to listen to guys talking and using Morse code. 
I practiced my Morse code skills and a coworker of my dad gave me my novice test at our house. Four months later, my dad and I rode the South Shore train from South Bend to Chicago and I got my general class license at the FCC field office there. Now I could communicate with lots more people around the world. After the man graded my test and I learned that I had passed the general class, he asked me if I wanted to take the advanced class. That had never even crossed my mind. He said, you might as well since you're here. I missed passing the advanced class test by two questions, but looking back, God had a plan. For you see, had I answered those two questions correctly, I wouldn't have pressed on and studied deeper. Three years later, three years, my dad and I went back to Chicago. This time we drove a lot faster than the train with all its stops on the way to Chicago and back. This time, uh, and I passed both the advanced class and the extra class, which is the highest. During my four years of high school, I converted my C, whoop, that was it, let me go back. During my four years of high school, I converted my CB radio into a ham radio. That's the same radio, but it's been converted. I spent four years doing this. I sometimes worked all weekend on it, after I got my homework done, of course. I worked night after night on it during the summer. Uh, I would be up till like 2 a.m. And my parents got mad at me because I wasn't doing the chores because I'd be, I'd sleep because it was quiet. And I'd like, I'd go to bed at like 2 a.m. Or, or later I was designing circuits and all that. I just loved it. Um, so I designed and built my own electronic circuits and here's a remnant of it. This is the beat frequency oscillator so that I could hear the Morse code and the sidebands. Now, this didn't happen overnight. I started out with one of my dad's old fishing tackle boxes, wow. and I put in it a few tools, fuses, pieces of wire, electrical tape, wire connectors, and an old voltage tester. But then, this book came along, Electronics for Everybody, and I don't know if I got a cir circuit in there, there you go, <laughs> um, that my close as a cousin Carl Shishoka gave me that got me started in electronics. Now, I'm not talking about me just to be talking about me. You're supposed to be discerning a pattern of increase. Yeah. All that aforementioned knowledge helped me succeed in college. I built this Heathkit digital multimeter and got school credit for it. It was too expensive for my parents to afford. It was paid for by my third grade teacher, Mrs. Snyder who was a strong Baptist, Baptist believer and loved me dearly. Mrs. Snyder, matter of fact, I think she's like the number one reason that I'm saved today. Um, Mrs. Snyder got my number from my mom and called me at Purdue and told me she wanted to do something for me. After I was born again, I looked back and understood that God had put that on her heart to meet my need. Do you think Mrs. Snyder had any idea that I would publicly acknowledge her act of kindness some 38 years later? Your acts of kindness go further than you can imagine. After moving out to Wichita and getting a job with Boeing, I bought the ham radio I always wanted, an ICOM 730. I haven't deviated from the topic of vision because as a kid, I had this picture of an ICOM 730 on my wall. You keep that before your eyes, okay? That was an exciting season in my life, but that season is over. It served its purpose. It's no longer important to me. God knew exactly what he was doing all along, even in the years before I knew him. Helping an introvert boy begin to develop communication skills. 12. Vision helps you focus on what's important now in this season of your life. But Chuck, I'm just trying to survive month to month, week to week, day to day. I don't have time to discover my vision. Uh, if that describes you, then you've just described your current vision. That's not what Jesus had in mind when he said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, in no way am I, say, am I suggesting that you change your job, start or stop school, or move to China. <laughs> But I am saying you need a vision that goes beyond the barely get by outlook. 13, vision helps you put up with a lot of things 
that pale in comparison to where you're headed. 14. Vision gives you something to hope for, to believe for, to exercise your faith on. Hebrews 11.1. 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Vision sees it before there's any evidence of it out here. 16. Vision causes you to have to decide what you believe. 17. Vision gives you a reason to grow spiritually and not be stagnant. Vision gives you a reason to put the past behind you and look to the future. 19. Vision gives you a reason to believe that things really are going to get better. 20. Vision is a glimpse of what God already knows is possible. 21. Vision isn't something you need to muster up. Chuck says, I need a vision. Got to get the vision. Where am I going to get the vision? No, 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 no. R relax. God will provide. God has already provided. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Prepared when? They're already prepared for you. 22, vision originates with God. 23, vision is consistent with what God has said in his word. He, it, uh, it, it will not violate his word. 24, vision resonates with what you know in your heart. What do you like to do? What do you want to do? What things are you passionate about? What happens in the world that upsets you? These are all keys that you can think about, about what's God called you to do. What is your vision? Vision, 25, vision is personal. It's given to you. Now, I've heard the term corporate vision, but I don't think a corporation is going to stand before God and give an account. However, Vision is corporate, and I thought you said vision isn't corporate. I didn't say it wasn't corporate, but vision is corporate in the sense that it will always involve other people in some capacity, sometimes a few people, sometimes lots of people. Yeah. It's in that sense that there will be an overlap, like when we play, each of us, we have a vision, and yet I'm responsible for mine, Gary's responsible for his, Debbie's responsible, etc. But we can still have a corporate vision, but the individual lies with us, with the individual. Habakkuk 2.2, record the vision and inscribe it on tablets. I guess nowadays you can inscribe it on your Android or iOS tablet. Whoop, wrong one. So write your vision down. When it comes to you, when you perceive it by the Holy Spirit, write your vision down because you'll need to refer to it again and again. You dare not trust your memory, which will tend to distort it. I'll just interject here that every time I get something significant from the Lord, I put it in, I have a one file, and I put it in there. I've got, I've got it going way back, years and years. It's pages and pages, and I can go back. What exactly did God tell me to do, or whatever, or what was this? If he was, it was something that was that was going to happen in the city or something like that that he was sharing with me the, to pray out. I've got that. I don't share with other people, but I've I've got it. And and so I can go back. And a couple of years ago, I went and read reread the whole thing, and it was like, oh, there's no way I would have remembered that. So write your vision down. Write what God shows you, so you can go back word for word. What exactly did God say? Don't guess. During a period of doubt or apparent delay, that means it's not happening according to your timetable, you can go back and reread it word for word to restore confidence. I had a fantastic barber growing up named Pat Contanzerite. He had an old tube type radio in his shop that didn't work. I remember it had a curved top, like this picture of an old radio, 
I asked him to let me fix it, and I took it home. Next haircut, I brought it back, plugged it in, and it worked. I didn't need to convince him that I understood basic electronics. He heard the evidence. Yeah. So the point here is, let the evidence of your vision speak more than you speak about your vision. Let people see it. Let the evidence of your vision speak more or louder than you speak about your vision. And, and people will know. They'll, they'll know. <laughs> 27. Vision will incorporate your gifts and talents, both natural and supernatural. Not every child who says they want to be an astronaut when they grow up is going to make it into the space program. But you can still cultivate their dreams and interests. Remember the yellow Gilbert Chemcraft box on the floor of my bedroom? My bo parents bought me that chemistry set around third grade. There was not much left of it. A tiny beaker, some phenophthalene test paper, this spectroscope, and this Bunsen burner that I had in my bedroom to heat compounds and observe chemical reactions. And I knew most, we're talking about vision, I knew most of the chemical of the elements because I had the periodic table of the elements hang up in my bedroom. I aced chemistry in high school. <laughs> my parents bought me Heath kit electronic kits like this vacuum tube voltmeter because that's what I wanted for Christmas. My bir birthday and Christmas were like eight days away, so <laughs> I could get something big. After, after I soldered all the parts onto the circuit board and wired everything up, I then had another piece of test equipment to use to fix old radios and TVs. Because of all that electronics experience, I made money for college in a high school work program uh, by working in a TV store. I made $2.90 an hour, and my boss charged $44 an hour for labor, so when, he got a good deal when I shared on the TV repair work. <laughs> My high school math teacher asked me if I was interested in joining their first ever computer class. I was a sophomore and all the rest of the kids in the class were well-behaved seniors that I looked up to. I loved it. The computer was actually located at Notre Dame, connected via a phone modem. I'm pretty sure it was a Texas Instruments Silent 700. There was no computer screen and it printed the answer on expensive thermal paper. And uh, here's a 1978 printout of a Star Trek program I like to play. Yes, kids, all the way back in the 1900s. <laughs> we had computers. <laughs> the weird thing about that is if you put a piece of that in your pocket, the heat of your, po your body will turn it black. So I gotta make, if I want to keep it, I've got to make sure that I don't leave it in the car afterwards. I can remember the evening I brought home from school a booklet on how to program the basic programming language. I read the whole booklet that night. I mean, I devoured it. Then my mom bought me a Timex Sinclair 1000 computer at Ben Franklin Variety Store so I could write my own programs at home. What do I do at work and as a ministry? I write software programs. God knew. 28, vision requires you to exercise and develop your talents and even learn new skills. Chuck, you have a lot of talents. Yes, but everyone is better at some things than I am. If you've ever, I'm going to give you a couple examples here. If you've ever played a sport in school, you're better than I am. The closest I got was sixth grade basketball manager, and that didn't mean I managed the team, that meant I managed the basketballs. Okay. <laughs> If you like to run, like to run, you're better than I am. If you can paint or draw a picture that people would actually recognize, you're better than I am. If you can play a wind instrument, you're better than I am. If you work with plants and like it, and like it, you're better than I am. And lastly, if you're behind someone at 21st and Mays who stops at the green right arrow, and the way is clear, and it doesn't upset you, you're better than I am. 
I wish they'd do something on TV that said, this is what the green right arrow means. Anyway, 29, vision reveals how uniquely God created you. 30, vision causes you to look beyond yourself, beyond your own needs. 31, vision requires you to pursue God and to trust him to bring it to pass. Vision causes you to strive for excellence and not settle for the mediocre. Good enough is the enemy of excellence. 33, vision requires God's grace to empower you and grace sustains the want to even when things get tough. 40, uh, Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning. God sees the end from the beginning. He already knows how things are going to turn out. Regardless of whether you see the end from the beginning, it's okay. God sees it all. 34, vision causes you to seek the wisdom of God to know what to do next. So, I mean, this is real simple, but it just, this flashlight, you know, whether you see the end or not, it doesn't matter. You need to know the next step to take. That's all you really need to know. That's all you need to discern is the next step to take. And once you get there, you discern the next step, and you'll get, God already knows the end from the beginning, so it's okay if you don't see anything, everything. He does. It's important that we read this next passage. It's a little long. We'll go through it quickly. From Acts 10, because it shows the degree to which God will go to make his will known and how things work out when we do what he says. Now there was, I'm just going to read it here, just follow along. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, devout and fearing God, with all his household, doing many alms to the people and praying to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. Cornelius gazed intently at him and became terrified and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have gone up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and send for a certain Simon who is also called Peter. This man is lodging with a certain Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel spoke to him, departed, he called two of the household servants and a devout soldier from those who continually attended him. And having explained everything to them, he sent them the Joppa. On the next day, while they were traveling and coming near the city, Peter went up in the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became very hungry and was wanting to eat. But while they were pre preparing the food, a, a trance came over him. And he sees the sky opened up and an object coming down, something like a great sheet being lowered to the ground by its four corners, in which were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth, and birds of the sky. And a voice came to him, I'm, I am sorry, somebody should have yelled, I'm, you're supposed to be, <laughs> I'm sorry, let's, I'm supposed to be clicking after every one of these. Oh, sorry. And a voice came to him, I got, anyway. And a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common and unclean. A voice came to him saying, came, a voice came to him again saying a second time, what God has cleansed you must not consider common. And this happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. Now as Peter was greatly perplexed within himself as to what the vision might be which he saw, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having inquired about the house of Simon, stood at the gate. And they called out questioning if Simon, who is also called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter and while Peter was pondering about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. But get up, go down, and go with them, not discriminating at all, because I have sent them. P 
Peter went down to the men and said, I am whom you are seeking. What is the reason you are here? So, you, I mean, this is a very major thing that God's doing in Peter's life, and he's doing something really major in somebody else's life, and he's bringing it all together. Okay, this is very significant. 35, vision requires you to be led by the Spirit. What happened to Cornelius or Peter has never happened to me, but I would like for Andrea to come up and share an encounter she had with God. And we're talking about the degree to which God will go to make his will known. I was very content. I was 26 and had been going to Derby Church since I was six months old. My dad always made sure my sister and I went to Sunday school and children's church. When I was 13, my dad died. My mom said, I'm not going to church. It's up to you whether you choose to go. By that time, I'd already loved the Lord for a long, long time. I joined the church at my 13th birthday. And even though I was still 13, I knew I didn't want to go anywhere else. I said, I'm going. So from that point on, I went to church on my own. And the whole church adopted me. And I grew up with a family that is bigger than this church is that would take time to watch for me, watch over me, pray for me, even make sure there were things that would keep me involved. One of the ladies came up to me one day and she said, if I started a teen group, would you come? I said, yes, I would. Within a couple of weeks, we had a teen group. It grew up to 15 to 20 people, and it was a very strong connection. Uh, while I was in high school, one of the ladies said, would you come assist me in teaching the four and five-year-old class? I said I would, and I did. And at 26, I was still teaching that class on my own. She had rolled out and was doing something else. At 26, I was still very involved in the choir. We had a teen choir, and then we had a regular choir, and I loved it. The church showed me, and I realized last night while I was thinking about it, a friend and I would sing duets as high schoolers. And every time we got up there to sing, we would break into giggles. <laughs> you could not sing without giggling. And do you know, no one ever complained. No one ever gave dirty looks. And I realized that's because the people there loved us and were excited that we had joy in the Lord and wanted to be up there before them. And so it was like another cool thing. And by 26, I was on the Sunday school board. And I was very content. I had nowhere I wanted to go. I was happy. And God knew it. So every March, they would have an assembly of churches of the Nazarene at the big Kellogg church from all across the state. And I loved going to that. They had a huge choir, which, of course, ours was tiny. And we weren't always on key. And th but theirs was always just perfect. And then you would watch people meet each other. They hadn't seen each other for a year since the last time we had an assembly. And the atmosphere was just charged. It was just exciting. At that time, of course, you couldn't just turn on the computer and watch somebody preach. And every year, we would have a different preacher come. And it was a real revival time. And I loved it. So I would go early and sit, find my place where I wanted to sit usually at the end of the pew. And one time I was sitting there um, and just waiting and watching, and I had glanced down, and I heard this voice three feet above my head and right over to the aisle, and it said, when you get back from South Dakota, this is where you're going to church. And I looked up real fast, and there was no one there, no one within 10 feet. And I knew that God had spoken, and I had complete peace to leave instantly and go to that church in three months. With my background at that church, I had no desire to go anywhere else. I was in my comfort zone. So God stepped me out of this church of about 100, 120 people and took me into a place that had that many singles in it. And from there, I could go and tell you a lot of things that have happened, but only because I obeyed did those things happen. And you know, you can, you can think back and you think, what if I didn't go? Who knows? But I know that I had followed God's advice. He told me exactly where. He told me when. And it just happened to work out that my cousins were missionaries in South Dakota, and that's why I was going to South Dakota for a couple of three weeks to help me in the camp counselor. And so I had time to let go of the old, let people know, 
and had a time away from the church before I came back and went to a new place. And that's when I heard, heard God's voice. You know, I can always know that God said to me, when you get back from South Dakota, this is where you're going to church. And um, if I, in fact, the same month that I was in South Dakota, God was getting Chuck from Indiana into Wichita. And we met at that church a while later. So that was, you know, part of the plan. Thank you, Andrew. Number 36, vision fulfillment, in other words, fulfilling your vision, requires us to be willing and obedient. Andrea was willing and obedient to boldly go where God told her to go. That's a good splendid infinitive from the Star Trek show. And there's a promise with that. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. Vision has a cost. 37, vision has a cost, but God is worth it, you are worth it, and other people are worth it. 38, vision requires commitment and personal investment. I hope I didn't lose anybody there. <laughs> You're going over the line, Chuck. Don't be brought up commitment. No, vision requires commitment and personal investment. 39, Vision has achievable short-term goals along the way. That helps you not become discouraged. 40. Vision usually takes longer to come to pass than you expect. Don't give up. 41. Vision develops character. God isn't in a hurry. Habakkuk 2.3. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. In Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith chapter, we know that Abraham and others didn't always see the end of what God was working to accomplish through them in his master plan. But they had a part in it. Moses saw the promised land, but he didn't enter it into it. Oh, but what experiences he had. He was part of something really big, something that carried on beyond his lifetime. And how about us? Do we see ourselves as minuscule, insignificant, the what, me, attitude? What good could I accomplish? What significant thing could I do? Nobody seems to notice me. No, there is one who notices. He notices everything, and yet he loves us with his whole love. He loves each one of us with the entirety of his love. Nothing held back. He notices, and he has a plan, custom designed for you. Before you ever arrived on the scene, he knew you. Even if nobody ever notices you down here, you are significant to God. And the last number item, 42, vision isn't a have to, this is a get to. You and I get to participate in God's grand plan. Now, some people won't commit because of things like their dream seems impossible or too risky or cost too much or because of parents' expectations. Like, for example, if someone wants to be an, uh, an Olympic swimmer, but their parents insist that they go to law school. Or they're afraid or they're insecure. Or by what is called paralysis by overanalysis. Mm -hmm. They have to figure everything else out first. But we know God. We know God. He's demonstrated his faithfulness to you and me. He's never let you down, led you down the wrong path, ever. He's never asked you to do something that wasn't the very best for you at the time. You know how fast life can pass by. We don't have time to waste. On the other hand, don't get out of balance and think that you can never rest, go on vacation, or enjoy some hobbies. Our salvation isn't based on works. I'm not teaching on five easy steps to early burnout. Also, this is not being busy 
it's not about being busy for the sake of looking busy. It's about discerning what you and I are supposed to be doing. This verse brought me comfort. Jesus said to the Father, said to Father God in John 17, 4, I glorified you on the earth, having finished the work which you gave, which you have given me to do. He didn't have to do everything. He did the part. That's how we glorify God, by doing the part that he was supposed to do. So if we want to glorify God on the earth, we just do the part that we're supposed to do, okay? In closing, a, a need isn't a leading. A need isn't a leading. There are needs everywhere. You need to take it to the Lord. Lord, do you want me to meet that need? Should I pursue that? Ponder this. This blessed me. Jesus lived a perfect life demonstrated the perfect way, and yet the world wasn't in perfect shape when his earthly ministry was over. He did his part on earth, and even today you are benefiting from his life and ministry. You do your part, I'll do my part, stay balanced. Jesus said in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, for my yoke is good, uh, sometimes translated kind or easy, and my yoke, and my, and, and my burden is light. Everyone is at a different place in life. It's not for me to locate where you are on your journey. It's for you to locate where you are on your journey. You could be at the pinnacle of what God has called you to do in this season of your life. Or you could be ramping up. Or you could just be starting. Or you could be stuck out here. Or you could be phasing out. Or almost finished with something. At this point, you could take a break and wait on the Lord for new direction. Ensure you don't continue doing what God has already finished. And don't get stuck at either end. <laughs> okay. Some might be thinking, Chuck, I fought the good fight. I've almost finished my race. As long as you are still breathing and thinking, God has something for you to do. Get your mind off yourself and find some way you can bless someone directly or indirectly. If you could do nothing else, you could still intercede for your family and neighbors, for the churches and the move of God, for the caretakers, for the police force and government officials, for the ambulances and fire trucks you hear, for the people walking or driving by or who you see on TV or read about. 1 Corinthians 3, 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was giving growth. So then, neither the one planting nor the one watering is anything but God, the one giving growth. The one planting and the one watering are one. We're all one in Christ. But each will receive his own reward according to his labor. God doesn't owe us anything, but out of the goodness out of his goodness, he has promised to reward us for our faithfulness. Do not think it's too late for you or that you are unworthy. Jesus made you worthy to be called his brother and sis or sister. Will you join me in committing or recommitting yourself to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? This is between you and the Lord. The Lord will tell you what should be important for you, what you should give your attention to, and what should be unimportant to you and what you need to let go of, what you should let go of. We can do whatever God is calling us to do in this season of our life. We can do whatever God is calling us to do, each of us to do in this season of our life if we choose to. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and a sensible and sound mind. Let us not be afraid to be led by the Spirit. Let us, not in, uh, let us invite the Holy Spirit to shine his flashlight to show us the way to go next. There's no need to fear the unknown because nothing is unknown to God. There is no need to fear the unknown because nothing is unknown to God. So I invite you to repeat this simple prayer of dedication after me. You ready? Yes. Lord, Lord, 
Guide me. Show me the next step I should take. I'm willing. I'll be obedient. Show me what's important. Show me what's unimportant. By your grace, I will succeed at what you've called me to do. Amen. And the last one, thanks be to God who is always leading us in triumph in Christ. This is the end of the message, but the beginning of something great and rewarding for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.